What's up, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Believe in Falcons. I'm your host, Will McFadden. I am joined by my Believe and Falcoholic colleague today, Kevin Knight, host of Dirty Birds and Brews and writer extraordinaire over at the Falcoholic. He has just infinite amounts of uh, draft content over there for you guys to check out. And he is here joining me to go through a little bit of a mock draft exercise today. So, Kevin, how are you doing, man? Thank you so much for joining me. Good. Yeah, no, other than being sick and uh, hopefully will be minimal coughing fits on this one. This will be like the third pot I'm, I'm gutting through today. But uh, other than that, all good. Uh, this is one of my favorite times of the year. I love the draft content. Um, probably not going to hit 100 players scouted this year. I think the, that was my record last year. Um, but, you know, still still, uh, still plenty. Uh, and the Falcons, you know, four picks in the top, 79. I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting class. We know eight overall is very exciting. Uh, so I'm excited to get into it with you. A hundred players scouted, man. That's that was that's my record. Really impressive. Yeah. I, I just really I was just like, I need to get to hundred just to say I did it, you know, more than anything. And but yeah, no, I, I haven't hit that uh, recently. But that because you have to like full on commit to doing that number of scouting. Reports, yeah, dude, so. you have to yeah. like you come out of the basement just looking yeah. rough. Oh, yeah. I'd imagine yeah. after that you're just grinding tape left and what right. What year is it? <laughs> what's so what's your what's your favorite position to scout a lot of people everyone knows that i'm like a defensive line guy like i've always loved defensive line play um and i think most people might assume it's edge but i actually like the interior defensive line the best um i just think it's fun to scout i love like seeing the the subtleties of interior play where it's a lot more leverage it's a lot more hand usage and little movements and things like that there's just some like intricacies to it that i think are kind of underrated so I do really edge is number two, but uh, interior is, is my top. Yeah. <laughs> what about do you have a least favorite for me? I like I think it's it's corner because I, I love watching the corners. You just go through like a full game. And if they're oh, yeah. good corners, they get thrown out like twice. And so yeah, you're kind of no. like, all right, I'm spending 13 minutes to watch like two plays. Yeah, I, I don't like watching DBs, um, but yeah, I don't I just like don't scout quarterbacks um, like I'll like watch the quarterbacks play but like i don't even bother trying to make scouting reports on quarterbacks like it's full you know scouting. that the games are yeah. won and lost in the trenches absolutely that's definitely the reason not that i just don't necessarily understand what i'm looking at but uh no instead i just let let other people that are professional quarterback scouts uh do my quarterback scouting for me and then i listen to a lot of opinions and kind of go from there but yeah i agree with you db play is very like hit or miss um to where like I usually try to pair it. Like I'll try to watch a DB and the receiver they're playing against, so you can uh, get two done at yeah. the same time. But yeah, cornerback play is very like difficult. That was the one um, I never ended up getting to corner at Scouting Academy. Um, so that was like the one I didn't get to along with quarterback because quarterback there is like an entire program in itself, which makes sense because yeah. nobody nobody seems to be good at scouting quarterbacks anyway. But um, yeah, DB play is is very complicated. Um, and it's also like so athleticism reliant. So it's like you watch all this film and then you're like, oh, you tested out really bad. So what do we do now? You know, so it's like, <laughs> yeah. just throw it all out. No, I'm just kidding. The tape matters. Uh, that the Kamari Lasseter but, corollary. Yeah. 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 That's that's a, that's a good example for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, that it's it's fun watching the corners when they because they are like, you know, that's why I love Jeff Okuda. I was like, yeah, man, it's so much fun to watch this guy yeah. at, at a Ohio State. But it, it just it's it can be a slog when you watch like five or six games in a row and you're kind of like, all right, I've seen. Uh, every play that they throw to him, he looks great, but it's just yep. like a total of 12 times. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this has been a little bit of a preamble, uh, but we are going to get into our mock draft. Uh, we're going to go through the first four rounds and pick for the Falcons using Pro Football Focus's mock draft simulator. So Kevin and I are going to get into that. But first, the tournament is here. Bet Online is your bracket headquarters for this season with the best bracket contests out there and odds, lines, and info on every game and every round right up until the national championship. You can access the most up-to-the-minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices and even track your bracket real-time all the way through the tournament. Head to Bet Online today and get in on all the action. Remember to use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% Welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online. The game starts here. A Believe Nation, as you all know, we have partnered with Cut, the social betting platform. Cut is a peer to peer betting platform that allows you to bet directly against your buddies and other fans. That's right. You can join the Believe in Falcons crew and the Dirty Birds and Brews crew on Cut today, and you can bet directly against me and Kevin on your favorite sports, pop culture, 
and politics. Kevin, I know you love betting politics on Cut. It's it's wild how much you get into that stuff. But Cut is the ultimate put your money where your mouth is platform, and it is legal here in the state of Georgia. Be sure to follow at CutBet on all your social media channels and download the app via the App Store or Cut.com. Just use code Believe Falcons for a 10% deposit bonus. Cut. Put your money where your mouth is. You'd be All surprised right, how much political betting, you know, I could I could get into. You know, if I if I get in like back in 2020, man, I, I was like, you know, living and breathing those house races. So I, I probably would have had some great takes on that. But uh, just just yeah. absolutely ripping through SIGs and, and just firing oh, yeah. off bets on the cutout. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like a junkie. Oh, it's oh, yeah. crazy. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. So I've got the uh, the mock draft here fired up. Um, we we were talking about a little bit of the settings beforehand, but ultimately, you know, I'm not sure how much that's going to going to play in because this is just a fun exercise. We don't have to take it too, too seriously. Um, the goal here is is really just to talk through the strategy that the Falcons could employ, you know, where what positions could they look at at certain points of the draft? Where do we feel? maybe the value is best for certain players. I think that's going to be a really interesting conversation with wide receiver. I think that's going to be a really interesting conversation with corner, you know, as a a fitting little um, follow up there to our intro. So Kevin, are you, uh, are you excited to do this? And do you have any overarching Falcons draft thoughts before we uh, actually kick off the mock draft? Yeah. I mean, I I've done, I think like four or five official ones now. So I have a pretty good idea of how the board falls. And it's like, you know, it it really depends on how many quarterbacks go because that opens the door for somebody falling that shouldn't. And then that opens the door potentially to trade downs, um, which of course opens the door to more potential prospects available for the Falcons, um, you know, either through a trade down or whatever. But it does seem like the Falcons have set themselves up for a defense heavy start to this draft. Um, but they needed edge rusher for like the past five years and they did not add it. So uh, I'm interested to see what they eventually go with. I know I have my takes uh, and I'm sure you have takes as well, but I, I, I think this is setting itself up to be a pretty defense heavy draft. that could be maybe reminiscent even of the Rams draft from last year where they ended up drafting a ton of guys and playing a ton of guys and it worked out pretty well for them. So, and, but the Falcons don't have any, uh, any connection to the Rams, do they? That that's weird. I, why yeah. would you, why would I the, say that? the Rams? Yeah. yeah that's mm-hmm. so odd. We're here in Atlanta, Kevin. Well, you're in, in New York, but yeah. Um, I, I do think that that certainly could be in play and, and they have so far in free agency, not made a ton of moves, but they have seemingly cleared the deck for them to go defense heavy if they would like to in the draft, which has been a little bit of a Terry Fontenot. I think his MO so far, and, and he said so kind of out of the gate is let's address the needs in free agency. And then when the draft comes around, it frees you up to just kind of go best player available or guys who you think have interesting upside where maybe you're not pigeonholed into drafting a left guard. You can kind of say, hey, we really think that this safety that has dropped a little bit is going to be a game changer and let's let's go ahead and grab them. So with that, uh, that spirit, let's go ahead. I will share my screen and we can. Uh, Get started. Cool, cool. All right. All right. You see my screen? I can. Beautiful. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and enter the draft. We are not on the clock. The bears are on the clock. Wow. That was quick. Now we're on the clock. Man, technology's great. They've like really, you know, the 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 processing. Well, you have it on turbo speed, you know, but that's fine for our purpose. That's that's fair. Unless unless you're trying to trade up. Yeah, unless you're trying to trade up. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think we're gonna. I don't think we're gonna make any uh, any trades in this. So this will be a non-trade. However, dude, well, <laughs> all right. Number two, we've already got the uh, the Washington Commanders throwing a a big curveball and going with Joe Alt. This is a, this is two. a wild scenario. Yeah, uh, this, this is a little bit of a, a wild scenario. So we got Caleb Williams, number one. Joe Alt, number two. Drake, number three. Marvin Harrison Jr. Four. Malik Neighbors. Brock Bowers. Six. And Roma Dunze. So. Clearly, we got to go Jordan Daniels here, right? <laughs> yeah. This this reminds me of like uh, like what the mocks would have looked like before the season ended, where like Jaden Daniels was not like thought of as a top ten player, and like mm-hmm. Brock Bowers was considered like a top ten lock, and he still very well could go in the top ten. So, I mean, this the commander is going Joe Alta too. Probably not going to happen, but we're 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 not doing any trades. But he and so he probably yeah. will go before the Falcons pick. Oh, right? yeah. So, like, I, I think outside of Brock yeah. Bowers. 
if we swapped him and Jaden Daniels, it's not inconceivable that these are the seven players that go before the Falcons actually pick at eight, right? Yeah, I I think so. And ultimately, it's like we're not going to try to trade down. Obviously, if Jaden Daniels is still here at eight, Falcons are probably entertaining crazy offers to trade down. Um, But also, you know, the teams ahead of the Falcons would have also had those same offers come their way. So, um, you know, we'll just sort of operate under the assumption that the players on the board here are, you know, not with any quarterbacks are the ones that are available. And I I think this is a pretty good snapshot because ultimately, like the wild card is does one of the wide receivers fall? And, and you know, to me, Malik Neighbors would be the one that I would consider. Um, it's also another trade down opportunity if Malik Neighbors or Oradunze is there you know, a team like the Colts at 15. Um, Mm -hmm. They really want one of these guys, allegedly, and or Brock Bowers even. Um, So that could be an opportunity to trade down as well. But assuming this is where the board stands, you know, the obvious one is edge because the Falcons will have their pick of the top edge rushers. Um, And I'm curious, Will, what you think about the order of those guys because I think last year we heard that the Falcons were all over Jared Verse. But that was a different scheme, more of a 4-3, where I think he's a better fit. He can certainly stand up and has done it, but it's not as clean a fit as like Latu, who is a stand-up rusher, and you know Dallas Turner, who's that just crazy mm-hmm. athlete. But I'm curious what you think about those three guys, because they each have their merits, you know, and they're kind of all like one in like on a spectrum. You know, you've got Dallas Turner, who's like the absurd athlete, but he's got the longest runway. And then you've got like Verse, who's kind of in the middle, he's got the measurables. Not quite as much as Turner, but like more polished, but not as polished as Latu on the other end, who's like probably like Latu is probably like an eight to 10 sack rookie. Like he's one of those rare yeah. guys. But does he have the upside of Turner or or verse? You know, he doesn't have the ideal length necessarily or whatever, but did test out a lot better than I think people thought. So, I mean, I know PFFs like yeah, it's, I mean, has, has, yeah updated a lot too, like to, to where Latu may even be considered their top guy. So, yeah, I mean, it's weird that, yeah, he's ranked 11th there. We can see that, that Dallas Turner is 16, uh, Jared versus 17. But the way that I kind of view these as like your three starting Pokemon, right? And you, you get your pick of, of which do you prefer? What do you, yeah. what do you kind of want to build around? What are the skill sets that you're looking for to plug in to your specific scheme? And I remember there were two players, interestingly, last year when we were going through the, uh, the draft stuff. And I kind of reached out to you um, about Latu and Bo Nix, ironically. Uh, and I was just kind of like, because I thought both guys were coming out last year. I don't know why it was kind of early in the process and dudes hadn't fully prepared or, or announced they were returning yet. And I loved both of those guys. And so I think that removing value, removing scheme fit, Leatu Latu is, is my favorite player. Um, I... I played rugby in college, and to me, he reminds me of a rugby player. Just that that kind of natural athleticism in space, but then through contact, the way that he carries and continues his um, power. And you never really see him feel like uncomfortable or uh, thrown off guard. He looks like he always has a plan of attack, even when that uh, plan of attack kind of doesn't go the way he expects it to or is countered effectively, he doesn't look flustered and he looks pretty in rhythm and he does have a wide arsenal of of moves already. And so, yes, there are some questions about, you mentioned his length, kind of that overall top end athleticism that you would get in a guy like Dallas Turner. But we've seen that before. I mean, I I was reading some of the comments um, on the Falcoholic last night and, and a lot of people were bringing up Vic Beasley and his combine performance and just the incredible assessment. And like I saw him in the locker room, dude was absolutely jacked, like looked like a superhero. Um, yeah. But we also know that that didn't necessarily translate to an incredible career with the Atlanta Falcons. So it's a give and take. It is a, a little bit of a beauty um, is in the eye of the beholder here. I, I think you could maybe get lots of later on, but, as we all know with this like draft process is what we usually do is we just look at a bunch of mock drafts and then we build a consensus about where guys are supposed to go and teams view things very differently. And if the Falcons view one of these guys as the clear number one edge rusher, then they should just take them to eight, you know, value be damned. So I know that I just kind of did a little 
selling pitch for Leatu Latu. I, I like Jared Verse a lot, but again, as you mentioned, I, I think that he fits a little bit more in that Ryan Neal or three, um, that type of defense where you're going to have to like stack and shed blocks against the run. You're also going to be expected to rush the passer, passer in the four-man front. So I think I, I tend to lean Dallas Turner just because when you look at when you look at what Will Anderson did for Houston's defense last year, and I think this defense could be a little bit similar to what, what Houston did. I, I just think that he has the upside in year one as a rookie. You mentioned Latu being the, the guy who probably could come in here and do eight to 10 sacks. I wouldn't be shocked if Dallas Turner ends up with eight sacks. You know, I wouldn't also be shocked if he ends up with like four sacks. And at that point, I think a lot of people would be like, cool, we took somebody at number eight and he ended up with four sacks. Like, great pick, that stinks. Mm-hmm. I, I think that Dallas Turner is more the upside play over the length of his career. But there is probably some short-term return that he could bring to this team and he should have every opportunity. So of these guys, for me, it's Latu and, and Turner, but I think Turner is maybe the highest swing, um, even though in year one, Latu may be the better, more productive guy. And so if the Falcons are, are really in on 2024 and a short-term window, maybe Latu is, is the way to go there. But are you sold that it's going to be edge here in the first round? Or, you know, could you be talked into a Terry and Arnold, a Quinion Mitchell, one of those guys, um, or even another position in general? Like, is it solely edge for you or could you be persuaded to go elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I think cornerback is the other one that is probably the serious conversation. Um, I, I just don't see these corners as being top 10 guys. I really do like Quinion Mitchell. Um, so he would be the one I would consider the most. Terry on will probably be number two for me. Um, I like Cooper DeGene a lot too. He's super versatile. But I do too. to me, it's just like, I don't think they're top 10 caliber. So if you trade down, like that's the thing. And that's part of the reason I think a trade down is very much on the table because if the Falcons like Latu and Quinion Mitchell and they trade down to like 12, they're probably going to get one of those two guys or, yep. you know, Dallas Turner or somebody else. Um, so they've got options and, and a lot of these guys are pretty close in ranking. I also do think like if Malik neighbors is there at eight, that that's going to be hard to say no to unless they mm-hmm. get a haul and a trade down, just because I think he's like a top five caliber, like, if not for Marvin Harrison Jr., he would be talked about as like a top, you know, three caliber player. But Marvin Harrison Jr. is here. So, you know, he they're not going to be in contention for Marvin Harrison Jr. But um, Malik Neighbors is a great compliment to what Drake London brings. Um, and, you know, yes. that with the offense being clearly a point of emphasis, I mean, I, I wouldn't count that out. But to me, you know, Jared Verse is probably going to and as my number one overall edge player from just grade. But in terms of fit for the Falcons, I agree that he's the least the least good fit. Um, to me, like, what it comes down to is, you know, how much do you want to bet on being able to develop Dallas Turner? Because he's going to be a designated pass rusher this year. He's not ready to play the run. He needs to gain weight. Um, and he's just pretty raw. He's not like Chop Robinson levels of raw. Like, don't get me wrong. But... Um, <laughs> yeah. He's he's a, a crazy athlete. His fr- like he's like Vic Beasley. If Beasley had arms that were two inches longer, like and was also more athletic, that's who Dallas Turner is. So like Turner kind of answers the questions that Beasley's profile had, which is lack of length. Um, and he's also more athletic. So it, pretty absurd, obviously, to think about that. But I've seen so many great athletes come and go in this league. Um, and this isn't to say anything about. Turner's character or ability to be coached or anything like that. We just don't know the guy. But to yeah. me, if I'm staring at an eight to ten sack a year player in Laatu Latu, I and you're looking at the timeline the Falcons have to win over the next two to three years. I to me, I actually do think Latu is the one I would pick. Um, and let's I do think, it then. Let's do yeah, it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. Um, and I I honestly think that the Falcons will probably take Latu as well. I know everyone wow. thinks okay. that they're going to want to develop an edge, but like w- Latu's testing. Dog, look at that grade. <laughs> it's absurd. Yeah. 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 45 hurries last year, too. That's nuts. Um, yeah. It, 
Latu's testing closed the gap between him and Turner athletically. Like, yes, Turner is a better athlete, but like Latu's RAS is higher because Latu has better size. He doesn't have better length. Latu has like 32 and 5 eighths arms, which is like just slightly under threshold. It's not like bad. It's just not good. Like typically you want 33 or more, but I wonder if that matters also- as much as a stand up edge rusher, though. With, it does, without being it, like right there on the line, you know, can you can you negate that a little bit because you've got a little bit more of a runway before you actually engage with a tackle? So yes, and he is so technically sound. This is the most advanced college pass rusher I think I've ever seen. So like, yes, like he, the the length is not going to be as much of an issue for him as it would be for a lot of guys because he just knows how to play. And to me, I. As, as nice as it is to go for the ceiling, and NFL teams, no one's more confident in their ability to, dra- to, to develop players than NFL coaches. Like, that's why they're where they are. Um, <laughs> yeah. But NFL coaches are wrong a lot. And to me, if you're staring me in the face with a guy like Latu who is ready to go, and you have this immediate screaming needed edge, and, and maybe they do make a trade for like a Hassan Reddick or something to where they could afford to have someone like a Dallas Turner work their way in a little bit faster. Or like have more of a runway to having to, to play. Maybe that leans to Turner a little bit more, but just <clears throat> Latu, like, he's a fine athlete. Like, in fact, he's an elite athlete. He's just not like Dallas Turner levels of, of absurdity. And I think you're just splitting hairs when you're trying to like maximize the profile to that extent. I, I don't see any reason Latu Latu can't have a TJ Watt like career, you know, and I'm pretty sure that's um he's been comped to TJ Watt. I think it was either by Zero Line or maybe PFF, but, um, you know, TJ Watt also tested great, but not like amazing, like 10 out of 10 testing. And it hasn't like that level of difference is not going to determine whether you're a pro bowler or not. You know, it might determine if you're like the number one overall edge rusher in the NFL or not. But to me, it's like, it's splitting hairs when it's like, I, I would rather have the polished day one starter than the slightly better like 10 out of 10 athlete that I have to coach up because and and you know the medical things are there for Latu too by all accounts he has gotten the thumbs up um so you know we'll see but yeah to me it's like I I just I'm done like betting on traits in the top 10 like it's like if you have like (laughs) it's just like splitting hairs with the difference in athleticism and it's like just just take the guy that you're confident in being able to step on the field. And I think that's a lot too. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are two little coaching factors in this in, in the Dave Huxtable uh, is a Falcons um, senior assistant. And he was with Alabama there for a couple of years. So he obviously has direct knowledge of Dallas Turner, but then you could easily sit there and say, well, all right, Jimmy Lake was also at Washington yeah. when Latsu was there. So like you can, I know if, if you try to grab an edge on one of those guys, no pun intended, uh, based on a coaching factor, like it kind of can be a wash with that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think Latu, he is our pick. Uh, he was, I think, my very first mock that I did uh, for Believe was I had Latu go into the Falcons. So I'm glad that you agreed there. And then we we see a little bit of a run on, on corners after this. So we got Terry and Arnold, Cooper DeGean, Quinion Mitchell going. So bye bye to those guys. Um, then Nate Wiggins go into the Colts. Dallas Turner goes 16. And then a huge run of tackles, which I do yeah, expect like to happen. Four. Yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely going to happen. Jared Verse, good good little steal there for the uh, the Dolphins. Jane Daniels all the way to 23. Wow, the Vikings just lucking out there. Yep. Uh, then we got some more offensive linemen going off the board, um, which brings us down here to 43. Keon Coleman going the pick before. So... Where do you, where's your head at for this second round? Now that we've, we've taken care of edge, is it wide receiver? Do you want to continue to add to this receiver group? Is this where you maybe find a corner that you, you like to maybe plug into that number two spot? Where, where's your head going? Yeah, let's scroll down here a little bit. Let's see what we got. Um, yeah, Penix and Knicks are there. Michael they Penix, be, interesting. be tempted yeah. by those guys. Um, Personally, I love Roman Wilson in this offense. The idea yeah, of that. He is um, very exciting. It, yeah. Jonah Ellis, we could pair him with his brother. Yep, yep. Okay, yeah. So there's not really any corners that we would be considering here. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, honestly, um, to me, if the board were to fall this way, I think you would either consider one of the quarterbacks. And I don't believe that Penix will make it to the second round. I think Knicks could. Um, to me, I would add Darius Robinson um, because I he's he's not really an edge rusher. He's capable of playing edge. He's probably a perfect 3-4 defensive end, to be honest. Um, he's huge, tremendous athlete, dominated the senior bowl. Um, he plays all over. Um, he doesn't play nose. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's like less than 300 pounds. But the Falcons need defensive line help um and i think you know i I like Braden fisk a lot but he's gone he actually went earlier than robinson which is kind of interesting i know some people will say like oh you should just double up on edge and take chop robinson i i'm scared by chop a little bit um (laughs) i I don't i don't like raw pass rushers now in the second round it's not so big a deal but um yeah to me i would probably go with one of the quarterbacks or with Robinson um, because I do Darius Robinson to be clear because there's two Robinsons right next to each other. Yeah. Um, Just because I I think you can never have too many good defensive linemen and we know that Grady Jarrett's coming off that ACL tear. It may take him, you know, it was a little bit earlier in the season so hopefully he'll be back to full strength but he may need a little bit of time Um, and Robinson could play five tech for you if you want that bigger presence against the run. I think he can play three. Um, so I think he can do stuff and fill in wherever. Um, he, you know, I think he is more of an interior guy or a five tech type of three, four defensive end than like an edge rusher per se. Maybe if you had him in like mm-hmm. a four, three, he could be your big end. Um, but I think he can stand up like at 295, which is nuts. But I, I don't recommend that. Like, I think that's he's not a bender, but he is really explosive and strong. And as a linear pass rusher, I think he's really good and and has a lot of potential and again he is raw so like i just said i don't like raw pass rushers but i think the falcons have a runway for robinson where you're just looking at value here and him being able to sort of sit behind grady jarrett and david on and and have an opportunity to just kind of fill in wherever he's needed um i like that fit but the quarterbacks are very tempting like if michael penix michael penix is actually here you know you'd have to think they would be strongly considering that same thing with with Bo Nix um just because they don't have that third quarterback and like if one of those guys does fall you know they'd ha- you'd have to think they're considering it strongly you know they would I think they would probably have to be like Penix like they're like okay we like his upside we think we can coach him up because Penix I think is the one that actually has like legit NFL starting upside whereas I think Bo Nix is mm-hmm. just like a really good floor quarterback where he can be your like 12 year backup Matt Schaub type of guy and Matt Schaub to his credit actually did have a good run as a starter. So um, no, no slander intended to either player, yeah. but um, not exactly likely, but Penix Penix needs time. That's the only thing. Like he does not handle pressure and he's got the medicals. So it's not out of the yeah, question. It's, it's that the time in the medical, because of that. Right. But yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, to me, it would be Robinson or Penix, but I'm curious what you think about what we have left on the board here. I know you said Roman Wilson. He is very tempting. I mean, there are good wide receivers here always. Yeah, I. so my one kind of concern, although I think you did a, a good job of explaining why maybe I'm, this concern is misplaced, is even losing Clayus Campbell, even losing Bud Dupree, like look at, at the Falcons defensive line and, and they're like young guys that you would like to have a little bit more of a pathway to seeing the field. And so when I look at what we've done or what we could potentially do in adding two more guys to that defensive line group, then all of a sudden I'm like, all right, that's a lot of mouths to feed, but maybe it's a survival of the fittest situation. And maybe it's, all right, look, like what kind of allegiance ultimately do you have to an Arnold Epicady if if he can't beat out a Darius Robinson or more? likely like a la- layout to lots because that's more of a one-to-one and when you when kind of you think about it a lot of the young guys that they have are more of those edge rusher types whereas you accurately pointed out Darius Robinson is more coming in here to probably fit with Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata and Zach Harrison and be that type of interior three four lineman as opposed to your outside edge rusher um so for that reason like I 
I think that if you and and looking at the board and particularly looking at this needs thing, how nice is that that the Falcons are just <laughs> very simple needs listed? Mm-hmm. I can't remember the last time that it was it was that easy. Usually they're they're sitting over here like the right the Raiders. Yeah, the Raiders. They've got like oh seven God. of these. Yeah. Um, so from that standpoint, it is a little bit of a you can go in whichever direction you prefer. And if you feel like Darius Robinson's ability and Again, that versatility, because that is going to be, I think, a key part of this defense is having those simulated pressures, having guys who can do a little bit of of different things so that post snap, you can start in one spot and end up in another. And you need to have guys who are comfortable doing a a variety of different things. And Darius Robinson isn't your your typical like edge rusher who can then drop into the, the flat zone and do different things. I do think he brings a level of versatility that would be very beneficial in this defense. So I'm right there with you. I I think that when it comes to the quarterback question, right, you you really got to believe that one of these guys is truly going to be a franchise quarterback one day, right? Because otherwise, having Taylor Heineke in place and then drafting um, if he's just ultimately kind of a backup quarterback, Using the logic that we did to to draft Latu, that was a little bit more of a short term. Let's go ahead and get a dude on the field who we feel can help us in 2024 and be part of that that of the playoffs. If you're drafting Penix, that's going in the opposite direction, right? That is saying we believe that in two years, when hopefully Kirk Cousins has delivered two Super Bowl rings to the Falcons and then is sent off in a blaze of glory, that then he is ready to to step up and and continue that winning trend, then that's worth this pick, in my opinion. But if if there's any question of whether he can be that, and to me, the medicals worry me a little bit because that is something like some players come into the league with that big injury history and and it never really impacts them. You never see yeah. it pan out and, it, and it's really good and, and somebody ends up getting a steal because the medicals drop them down the board. Other times... It's, hey, there was a red flag there for a reason, and their career ends up cut short, or either not the player that you expected them to be at this level because they are hampered by those past injuries. So that's kind of my, I, I don't doubt Michael Penix's ability. You know, I think the last couple of years have, have more than proven that he is a really good quarterback. And if he did not have those red flags medically, like he's probably a top 10 pick. It's it's easily, I think, him over J.J. McCarthy in that kind of fourth quarterback spot. So it's great value here. And then the wide receiver, seeing these receivers still on the board makes me a little bit more um, able and willing to kind of say, let's let's wait on wide receiver. Yeah. And maybe, because I do think that this could happen as well. If there is any one position, is is I could see that them slipping down the board just because there are yeah. so many good receivers so many that yeah. teams would prioritize those offensive linemen these edge rushers the corners things like that where there are maybe fewer guys so I'm right there with you I think it's Robinson or Penix for me so the question is Kevin do you just want to juice up this 2024-2025 team or do you maybe want to do what this franchise couldn't previously and get that heir apparent give him the time to develop in this offense under a quarterback who you know, can be a little bit more of a mean score figure where where do you think the uh, the wise move is i mean i think it it's probably going to be darius robinson um and going for that more win now window because again you've got cousins here for two affordable years maybe a third or a fourth if you want to pay the premium and again, Michael Penix, it makes sense for the Falcons to draft a developmental quarterback. I don't know that this class is the one to do it in. Um, and they may just decide to go for someone further down the board as well. Um, because it, like you said, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense with their other moves that they're going to just try to use their second best pick to, to bolster a need that's three years out. Um, so yeah, I think it would be Darius Robinson here um, because it, it's, it just makes sense, I think, with their timeline. Um, and also, Michael Penix Jr., you know, the other reason he's falling is he is an older rookie, too. So if you're going to have him sit two to three years on top of everything else, he's mm-hmm. probably going to be 28 years old by the time he's playing. So 
that's the other part. Like I think Penix is that bad mix of medical concerns, needing some development against pressure and being an older rookie. So it's like you kind of want to get him on the field immediately because he's older, but he needs time to develop. So then he's going to be older when he does play. And it's like your runway is shorter with him and teams typically don't like that. So um, I agree with you. I think they're probably going to shy away from the quarterback here. All right. Darius Robinson, welcome to Atlanta. I'd be pretty excited if he does. Oh, Bo Nix, pick forty-four. Oh man, that. Oh, the Darius Bo. Robinson. It's yeah. No, if, if Bo, if, if Robinson does fall there, I think they'd be pretty excited to get him. So, all right. All right. So, wow, we had that run of receivers happen right there. So, yep. Just yep. to, yeah. what has happened? Bo Nix. Then we got some edge defenders going. Chop Robinson, your favorite player. In the draft goes to the Bengals, and then. Then the receivers start to hit kind of there at the, the second round. See those guys go. Xavier Leggett. Wow, that's a that's solid value for the Cardinals. Yeah. <laughs> Getting him at 66. Yeah. As Walker. And in, yeah, in my last mock, um, I had the Falcons trade down from 12 or to 12. And then I had them trade up to 60 to get the wide receiver they wanted. So I think that they could definitely consider doing like something like that, too. If there's a wide receiver <laughs> they really like in that range, because they a lot of them do tend to go here. Before this pick, now there's still plenty of wide receivers. That's the other thing. Um, but you know, yeah, if they do have somebody they good. love, yeah, I mean, they got, yeah, there's there's definitely options here. Um, it's definitely, you know, if they want that like high end potential wide receiver too, they probably do have to trade up for that guy unless they get lucky. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Xavier Worthy, I think, has that potential. He went just a couple picks ahead, so that's not out of the question. Um, but yeah, there's definitely good wide receivers available here. Um, and then the Falcons do pick again in like five picks. So that's important to note. Um, yep. but yeah, this type, this part of the draft, this is like spent Spencer Rattler hours. If you're a Spencer Rattler fan, um, you know, Tavondre sweat is one guy yeah. that I take a lot here just cause now we've already added two defensive linemen. So I guess we could just, I was going to say, I don't like, know if we can the defensive line draft, just like. <laughs> This is the beef draft. We've added the beef um, up and down. So we would have added like a half of a defensive line in this draft. Yeah. It's like we've got the edge rusher, we got the five tech, and then we got the one tech uh, all in the same draft. But um, that's probably a, a little much. But like Max Melton at corner, he's mm-hmm. someone that's really impressed. Um, I definitely like, I have to see who the safeties are that are left, but I definitely like guys like Dadrian Taylor Demerson in this range. Um, I know Cole Bishop has fans too. Um, so there's definitely, you know, yeah. options Luke there. Luke Easterling, who I, I spoke with earlier uh, last week on the pod, uh, he had Renardo Green go into the Falcons. Yep. Yeah. I think um, in his, his draft mock draft. So, you know, that's another name. Um, and he would bring kind of that versatility, safety inside, outside, that type of deal. Um, yep. That I do think is going to be on display. Michael Hall Jr. is still here, but same same issue with kind of just going defensive line. Yeah, we kind of like um, addressed the interior with the uh, the Darius Robinson pick. So, I mean, I think like with Sweat, you know, yep. they don't really have a nose. So it's like you could probably still pick there, but that would be a lot of beef. Like, I don't know if these guys are all going to be able to fit on the plane back to Flowery Branch after the draft. Like, <laughs> so we might have to spread them out a little bit. Um, especially Sweat. Like, yeah. <laughs> So uh, is he's, it, he's a host. Yeah, yeah. no, I, he's. I mean, but they do need kind of, I think, that that guy to plug right there in the middle. But again, just given the way that this this draft has gone, you know, I think we can go in a, a different direction. Yeah, if if Sweat wait. is there at 70, then then maybe that's we circle back around. Um, what are your thoughts on Spencer? Yeah, let's see. No, I'm not too concerned about the interior anymore with the Robinson edition, but, um, you know, I think Max Melton, certainly one to consider. Um, if you have, if you like absolutely love one of the wide receivers near the top, there's like a slight chance one of them might go before 79, but not a huge one. Um, um, yeah, I mean, to me, I think it's like, if you love Spencer Rattler, if if you think he has a good developmental timeline, um, you know, that could be an option here at 74. I think, uh, also got Michael Milton. Pratt. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think to me, it's like, 
I like I usually like to go like either Malachi Corley or like uh, Brendan Rice at 79. Um, you know, very different types of receivers, but I think both of those guys usually make it there. Um, you know, Max Melton probably will go before 79. We're looking at corner, but again, those FSU guys are still there. So um, the only thing about the mm-hmm. FSU guys is that I think the Falcons are going to play like zone, like lots of zone, like zone yeah. primary. And both of those guys were tremendous man corners, but they just didn't do much zone. Um, so it doesn't mean they can't play zone. It just means that it, it might not be as clean a fit. But again, it, I, I'm pretty confident that they can play zone if you ask them to. It's just like they didn't do it a ton and they didn't do it. They were like elite man coverage corners, like their their coverage grades yeah, and like, man were absurd. So get their hands on talented, guys, so. run with them, stick in their pocket. Yeah. yeah and this is going to be a little bit yeah. more if it is man, it's going to be off man or unless you're doing yeah, that, maybe. Yeah cover six and they have a cloud corner, but I would expect that the rel anyway, like you're going to probably put yeah. your best corner there on, on kind of that Island with a guy. So that, yeah. that is, but has been right. Malachi Corley is, is an interesting guy as well. Like he is somebody who I've, I think I've looked at around this spot just as that type of, you know, do a little bit of everything, get the ball in his hands, let him run. You can, he, doing those uh, those jet sweep motions, um, that type of of athlete, I you know, isn't Debo Samuel the yeah, guy that he yeah. he gets comp mm-hmm. to a lot? Um, so, offense like I, I'm of two minds. I could see them going either in that direction or going with um, like a uh, Malik, Washington Malik Washington or a smaller dude in that slot mm-hmm. and kind of that type of of prototype or not prototype, but that body style in the in the slot, just a, a small dude that Arthur Smith wouldn't go near uh, with a 10-foot pole, uh, as opposed to that really just big-bodied running back at a wide receiver position. Um, do you have a preference for soft? Yeah, I mean, I love Corley. I think he's good. Um, I know Aaron Freeman's like a Malachi Corley hater, so if you're listening, Aaron, you know, you're just wrong about Malachi <laughs> Corley. But um, I do think he's a little bit superfluous in Atlanta. They, they, I think Bijan's going to do some of that stuff for them. I also think that they signed Rondale Moore, um, who's also going to do some of that stuff for them. So maybe they just want like three guys that can all do that and just have absolute chaos. But um, I tend to think, and this this changed after they signed Mooney and the guys that they brought in, but I tend to think they're actually going to go for more of that outside bigger receiver um, instead of a smaller guy. I, I could still see them adding a slot specialist like if the right one is there, like, if Vlad McConkey fell to 43 or something, I think they would jump at the opportunity to do that. But um, I would I've found myself like leaning more <laughs> towards like Brendan Rice and stuff later. Um, just because like, you know, you can get Rice at 79 without problem. Um, and it, it it gives you another like big receiver because honestly, now it's like the opposite. It's like before it was like, oh, we have all these big guys and no speed. Now it's like we got all these little guys, but if Drake London gets hurt, like Kyle Pitts is the only tall guy, like physical receiver we have left. So I think Brendan Rice could come in, you know, and maybe we can make that the pick at 79. You know, it kind of makes sense to talk about both picks because they're back yeah. to back. Um, you know, I think we could do For Bryce sure. probably at 79 or someone similar to that. You know, I, I wouldn't argue with Malik Washington either. I know he's lower on the board here, but I think some teams will have him in this third round range for sure because he's just an, a slot specialist yeah. and he's very, very good at that. Um, but again, he is a smaller guy, but I don't necessarily see a problem with that in this offense. Um, but yeah, I think at this pick, it's probably corner just because like, I feel like those guys are going. And once you get past like Max Melton, you like Max Melton and like the FSU guys. And like, maybe if you were like, if you like Cam Hart, which I do, but he's more developmental then it's like, it really drops off yeah. a lot after that. So, um, you're not a big yeah, Kalen I, I King Max guy has a lot. No, I was until I saw the testing. Um, <laughs> and then I was less. Everybody was, less was until they guy. saw that tape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like Kalen Carson from Wake Forest a little bit later. But I think his upside is like good cornerback three. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd probably lean towards like a corner. I like Melton. He tested out super well. Great zone corner. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a good one. And then maybe All right, let's go uh, with Melton. Brendan Rice. Cool. Yeah. Brendan Rice would be in consideration if he's here. Um, we did see Rattler go and Sweat with 75. That's funny. Yeah. Sweat. Wow. Um, that would have been crazy. We're yeah. just like cool. We'll get we'll double up on sweat okay. at seventy nine. Lock it in, and then <laughs> yeah, that would have been <laughs> wild. The just the you. beef draft. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I I have no problem with I, like I like Rice a lot. I think he makes a lot of sense in this scheme. 
I think he's really smooth. I think he's a day one contributor. He's just not like a super high end. Like I know people say Rice and it's like, oh, he's got to be this like amazing, you know, Jerry Rice caliber player. It's, I don't know that he's ever going to be that good. But then again, people say that about Jerry too. Like if you look at his measurables, it's not like Jerry Rice's measurables were insane. Brendan Rice actually has a bigger build. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he's just a savvy receiver. Um, physical, he'll block. He can play slot. He can play outside. Um, so I, I like Rice. I think he fits what they need at wide receiver pretty well. Yeah, I I, I agree. So Marvin Harrison Jr. goes at, at four, but the Falcons land the uh, the son of legend in Brendan yep. Rice. So our last pick here of this mock draft exercise, we're at one hundred and nine. Um, and what what's your mindset here in the fourth round? Is it really just at this point you're just trying to get the the most tools to work with and develop, or are you targeting very specific? You know that slot specialist. Like if if you know that you're missing one element, is this where you're kind of like, let's a guy who does one or two things very well and will deal with the weaknesses that come with it, or again, just about upside and getting the best collection of traits for you. It really just depends on who's here, um, because I've. Sometimes there'll be somebody that just falls that you really love or like I haven't been able to address corner. So like if Chris Abrams drain, like Chris Abrams drains here, I like him in this range. Yep, um, like him. Uh, Cam Hart is another guy I'll Cam take Hart. care a lot. Um, Cole Bishop from Utah. Interesting. You know, Malik Washington, like part of me is like, I can't believe Malik Washington could be going like this late, but like I, I'm always tempted because I just love Malik Washington. But um, I did Muhammad Kamara from Colorado State. He's Hello. really good. I mean, he's um, about like 5'8". Yeah, Malik Washington's a, a little man. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, it's like d- the strength of this draft is wide receiver. And do the Falcons like need to load up on wide receivers? Probably not. But they've got a lot of day three picks. They ended up getting that sixth back from the Eagles that they sent for Contavia Streets. So they have that pick too. Um, you know, for the later rounds, and it's like maybe you don't need to. You know, I could see them doubling up on corner. I could see them going for like a Cole Bishop at safety if they wanted to address that. You know, th- again, this is a spot where you're kind of looking at like, okay, what kind of like developmental guy do we want? I know that Jacob Cowing has a lot of fans, super fast. DJ James, good cornerback. Xavier Thomas, for- former five star edge rusher, if you, if you want to develop mm-hmm. somebody. And they did um, that with Zach Harrison last year. That's right. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, you could go in a lot of ways here. Um, to me, it's like I kind of lean towards. Cole Bishop at safety just because they, they they still do need depth there. But I also just love Malik Washington and would just Me find too. ways to get Malik Washington in Atlanta if possible just because, like, he's so underrated. Like, he's actually PFF's number one college receiver from last year. Um, like, actually number one. Um, and overall, uh, in receiving grade, I think he was number one. So, um, 1,384 yards. I mean, he caught 111. And I was, just I was looking hog, at... Um, like, yeah. There was a, a piece on the 33rd team looking at the it's the um, basically like the the yards that a receiver contributes if you subtract the like air yards basically from a, a quarterback and it was a I'm just blank stat that it was but it was like a who's who of, of receivers coming out Malik Washington was like third on that list of basically just the yeah. impact that a receiver has above average um, and how they yeah we do with the ball and how they um, contribute to the air yards and, and just where they're targeted downfield Malik Washington in like every one of those measurables was up there at the top. And so again, I, I like, I think he probably will go before this, but if he does get knocked, it'll be because of that size. It'll be because he is more of that slot specialist. But I, I know that you're looking at Rondell Moore and, and kind of Darnell Mooney and some of those guys. And I do think there's going to be that inside outside versatility, but I don't know if they have a guy exactly like. Yeah. And I, I look at what the Rams had and I, I kind of think that they would be on Malik Washington. And for that reason, I think the Falcons could also be on Malik Washington. Yeah. I mean, you, the one thing you look at um, and like, you guys know, you don't like, don't just blindly look at PFF stats and be like, Oh, well that's got, that's why this guy's good or whatever. But one stat that I know has been right. correlated with guys performing really well is success rate versus man. Um, and, and PFF has their, you know, grade versus man. And you look at Malik Washington, who's got an 88.7. Um, you'll also look at things like contested catch rate. 
for a guy that's 5'8", having a contested catch rate like above 60 is pretty absurd. Like he has phenomenal hands. 2.6. Like this man had a 111 catches, almost 140 targets and dropped three passes. Like that is absurdly good hands. Yeah. Um, three, 3.15 yards per route, not yards per target, yards per route. Every time this man stepped on the field, it was like three yards, like on average. So um, I think you look at all of his stats and everything that he does, and it's just like, I think this guy is like an exception. Like he is a special, unique slot specialist. Um, From Georgia. I think, yeah, there you go. Bring him home. Lawrenceville, let's go. I didn't, that's one thing I didn't know. <laughs> learn something. Yeah. Bring him home. Bring him home, yeah. TF. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think you just do it because All right. this is a deep receiver draft. And like you're going to have to pay Drake soon. And you're going to have to pick Kyle even sooner. So getting cheap, <laughs> good yeah. wide receivers to complement what they have that they don't have to pay for a while, that D plus is just insulting. Um, but, right? you know, it... <laughs> for Malik, yeah, I mean, come on, yeah, I I don't believe it. we still get a B plus. So they, they, the the lower the pick, the less they care. But they love um, that Darius Robinson pick because I, I mean the value is great. Yeah, they do. Yeah, it is. But um, yeah, to me, it's like you add right in like the heart of this receiver group. You're not getting like the top guys or the like high end wide receiver twos, but you get I think a guy in Brendan Rice that can complement what Drake London does well. Play the red zone if you need that. And be Drake London's backup. That's probably what he's going to be this year for the most part. Um, yeah. Because they don't really have anyone to play that role. But I think perfect role for him to play is sort of Drake London's backup. If Drake has to miss any time, they don't have to change the offense drastically. And then I think you let Malik Washington duke it out with Rondell Moore for that slot job. And, and you know, Rondell Moore is going to be more of that, like, absurd athlete. And he's probably going to do more gadgety stuff. But, like, Malik Washington is just... He's so smooth. He's ex- crazy explosive too. Like I was looking at his yeah. RAS a second ago. He jumped 42 and a half inches. He's 5'8". That is absurd. <laughs> yeah. It's like you, that, could put like me on, me, you could put me on two benches and I couldn't jump that high. Like you know. <laughs> <laughs> he he is like he fills on the one hand that like Justin Hardy role, but he's much more explosive than that. Yeah. But he yeah. is like kind of that, hey, it's it's third and four, and we need to give a breather to Rondale Moore. We need to get like get out there and, and we're going to have you just run that five yard quick curl, put it low, go get it in the dirt yeah. and get down. And like, he would be a, a sure handed kind of trusting receiver. But again, he brings a lot of that explosive athleticism where there's the yeah. upside to do more. And maybe he runs away from defenders on that, like over route on those drags against man coverage and you get the ball in his hand. So it's weird. I feel like we were coming away from this draft being like Malik Washington, man. We're oh, I just love Malik Washington. Yeah. This like is the Malik Washington else. show. Yeah, no, I don't care yeah. about getting pass rushers. I just like Malik Washington. No, but yeah, yeah it. I I like it because it's he's that just reliable chain mover, and you you see this every year. Like a guy goes like early on day three and ends up being like a thousand yard receiver. You know, like Puka Nakua is like that. I don't think he's going to be a thousand yard receiver, but right. like for Atlanta this year, but like he's exactly that guy that the Rams target. Like, yep, great polished chain mover at slot and he's even more than that because he is explosive he has great contact balance and like he is five eight and a half and like under 200 pounds but he has over 30 inch arms like he doesn't have short arms um his arms are fine especially for his size he's got kind of long arms hit that elite six eight seven three cone um 19 reps on the bench which usually it's the guys that are under like for a receiver that's elite like that's elite so he can block that's huge i mean yeah so you know explosive 447 it's not even like he's slow so th- this is why i think you and i are like he's probably going before this pick but you know some teams let's start know, the draft over and yeah. we're going to take malik washington at eight yeah actually i've just this is what this show is confirmed is that i just love malik washington and i'm just gonna you know <laughs> draft him at eight uh but no i mean we should probably talk about the the other picks like you know i don't know Latu latu and darius robinson to bolster the defense or something you know I, I'm happy. I'm happy with with where yeah. we ended up. I think getting a couple of guys on the defensive line, um, both of whom should be immediate, like day one, if not, you know, starters, role players at the very least, um, but big time role players. Max Melton would come in here and is he like a clear day one? You're plugging him in at, at your number two corner spot. Maybe, maybe not, but he will definitely be in the mix. And I could totally see in training camp day four he's got like his first pick and puts together a huge 
kind of day and we're sitting there talking about like, man, Max Melton, like he could be a real steal there. So I like that we go defense early, but again, you're the crown jewel of this draft is the wide receiver position. And I think coming away with a couple of different types of wide receivers. And, and that was a big Raheem Morris thing. The first time around was yeah. they wanted clones of the starters so that if Julio Jones had to come out, the person they were put, I mean, you can't clone Julio, but that the body type, the abilities, the athleticism, like you want to put somebody out there that's as close to the starter as possible so that you, on the one hand, don't have to really change the offense too much. You know kind of what to expect if you're the quarterback playing and play out regardless of who's in there. But also because you just have those elements that you prioritize in your offense that really make it hum. And I think finding somebody who could be a replacement for Drake London if he you know, has to leave the game or if he, you know, unfortunately does suffer an injury, but then also adding Malik Washington who has that upside and is a little bit of a different skill set. And you're right. The Rams would draft him and he would go on to be just a yeah. future pro. He would just have like so. 700 yards, like randomly next yeah. year. Um, and that's the thing. It's like they, Kirk cousins is going to value those guys that are where they're supposed to be. Yes. Um, Bread and rice, great route runner, very polished receiver. He's going to be where he's supposed Smart. to be. Mm -hmm. um, Malik Washington, very polished, great route runner. He's going to be where he's supposed to be. And though Kirk Cousins is going to throw to those guys. Um, they're going to find their way on the field early. It's a good fit with him. And I know everyone is like, oh, well, the Falcons added three receivers. They don't really need to do much. No, they, they do. Like, it's, this is not. That room was barren. Is, yes. Yeah. Like, we need, like, it's like, we, it's like we, we signed Darrell Mooney and traded for Rondale Moore. Everyone's like, oh, okay, wide receiver's fine now. No. No, 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 no. Like <laughs> those are three. It, like those are just your starting nice. three in an eleven yeah. personnel grouping. But you have yes. like basically no depth. You've got no. Kadero Hodge, Hodge and like be that's starting. it. Starting, yeah, it's something. Yeah. So, um, and no slander to Kadero Hodge. He actually did a good job when he had to play. But um, I think you you really add a lot. And like this is a, a roster that could carry seven. So if they add these two to the four they already have, uh, and and Hodge, that's that's your seven. I'm sure that they've got you know they've got CFL legend Austin Mack in here to compete too. Um, so, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll see a spirited training camp, but you know, the, the, the Rams often carried seven. They're probably going to carry seven with this group. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the other side, like Brendan Rice, Malik Washington, both four special teams guys, if they need to be. Yes. Um, so we know how much this team's going to value that. And again, like, I don't know that Malik Washington really returned at all, but like, to me, I, I feels like someone that could, I think he, I think he did um, a little bit. I, I yeah. always get him confused with Taj Washington because I, I do think Taj yep. Washington can, was a returner uh, there for USC, but I do think Malik Washington did return some. Yeah, so it's like you're gonna like ret the return game is gonna be really important now. Like that, yeah. people don't understand how big. Like if you're one of the teams that is able to capitalize on the new kickoffs, you that's could, why I think, or, I think you could you know, see like, a running back. Yeah, go like if I was gonna do a dark horse, just like prediction. I could definitely see a day three running back because I think you're going to see kickoff like kickoff units utilize or kick return units utilize running backs back there a little bit more than kind of that twitchy Isaiah yeah. McKenzie for all the Georgia right. fans out there, that type of, of player, um, because it is going to be a little bit more of a red rover. Like you hit that first line as hard as you yep. can and break through it and, and maybe nobody else can get you. So yeah, yeah that, mm -hmm. That could be a, a different element and skill set for sure. But Kevin, I know we've run a little bit long here, so I'm going to wrap us up quickly. But do you have anything uh, that you would like to promote before I get us out of here? Yeah, I'll have a uh, on Friday. Um, the the in the last days of March here, I had Trevor Sikama on to discuss some of the similar stuff here, where the Falcons could go at eight. Um, also, got some really great insights into Raheem Morris um, and some stuff about his time in Tampa that I think Falcons fans probably aren't as aware of. And, and sort of the, the, I think you guys have heard some of the rumblings of the context behind his surprise hiring and then subsequent firing a few years later. But uh, Trevor actually did uh, gave some great info on Raheem and, and why he thinks that, you know, Raheem is a great coaching candidate for the Falcons and he's very excited. And also, you know, we talked about the draft a lot, but uh, that was <laughs> unexpected to get some Raheem co uh, conversation in there. So that, uh, that's coming out. And then um, our first live mock draft for the patrons and channel members will be uh, Monday. I think it's like April 2nd or something uh, in the evening. So if you're if you're one of those or want to become one of those, join us for our first uh, live mock draft with, with the fans. Heck yeah. I, I can't wait for that. I will definitely check out your uh, conversation with Trevor. Uh, he definitely he knows his stuff. Um, and I know Luke Luke Easterling was was high on the Raheem Morris hire as well. So those Tampa guys are just uh, jealous Crazy. of Raheem Morris yeah. coming here to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but again, thank you so much for joining me for this mock draft exercise, Kevin. Today's episode was presented as they all are by Bet Online. That will do it for us today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Keep your eye on the feed for the next one coming up. But until then, everybody, take care.